Our trips are back. We're talking FF7. We're talking Rebirth. We're here to look at some more translations regarding the Ultimania. We have just, of course, some random interesting bits regarding the game itself, but we do have some more shit for Part 3, which is particularly interesting. Looking at some more of Audrey's translations, but we'll also be looking at some of Shin Arc's translations too. They put out some kind of like summaries instead of direct translations now that's a little more safe for the copyright shit. Uh, I did forget to mention with our last video though, because we did a lot of Audrey translations, that we do got to put an asterisk next to all of her translations just because who knows, right? She's just kind of weird with translation sometimes. So let's just hop right into it. We're going to start off with a kind of spicy one. Namora says that in the original Final Fantasy VII, in order to depict the cruel loss of someone you cherish, they had Cloud be a bystander of Sephiroth killed Aerith. In Rebirth, they wanted to fight back against Destiny and have Cloud make an effort to parry Sephiroth's attack. However, when you actually lose someone you cherish in the real world, you aren't able to accept it right away. If F7 Rebirth strives to depict that inability to accept the loss of someone precious to you, Cloud's psychic interference reflects this state of mind. So I want to start with that one just because there's people that are still in denial that she's dead. Uh, outright entirely, but also some people think that like maybe she died here, but she's alive in other worlds. Is that possible? Sure, but we don't even know the the context of what these other worlds are, like because there are other worlds that are inside the planet, so they're like a part of the live stream. So is anybody in these other worlds even tr technically alive? Since it's a part of the live stream, right? We just don't have the, the knowledge. We don't, have no we don't know what these worlds are and shit. We're not gonna know what all this is until the third game. So we can theory crafts, we can do all that shit, whatever, whatever. But people talk like they know for sure what's going on. And then other than confirmation that Earth is fucking dead, at least in our world, in Beagle world, for sure dead. We don't know what's going on with the other worlds and the other different, like, errors and shit that we see at the end of the game, right? We just, it's all ambiguous, intentionally ambiguous, but for sure she's dead. I mean, that's what Namor is confirming here, right? It's kind of the problem with talking about this shit all the time, just because all the theory craft and this weird thing that the FF7 community's turned into over the last couple years, where everybody wants to be right and try to guess what's going on and think they know what's going on. Because, like, I'll just use an example. I'm not going to directly show the, the comment from the last video, but just the conversation we had in the comments on my last video. Somebody's saying that she is alive, that she's alive and, and dead in multiple worlds, like, like, for sure, she's alive in multiple worlds. And it's like, where do we have confirmation of that? We have no confirmation at all that Aerith is alive in other worlds, right? Not a bit. There's not an ounce of confirmation of that there's... It could maybe be interpreted that way, but we definitely have proof that she's dead because Namor just fucking said it. A lot of people are looking at the scene where Cloud blocks Sephiroth's attack whenever he's trying to kill Aerith, and you see, like, the rainbow effect come off the swords. And for the most part... I mean, we see that a lot in the game. But for the most part, that seems to, like, imply that another, like, timeline was created or whatever. We see that with Zack, right? When he's in the tunnel, he goes right. You see the other tunnel rainbow effect. So, a lot of people are interpreting that, that, like, that created a timeline where Earth is alive. And that's possible. Sure. I'm not writing that off. I'm not writing off her being alive in another world or timeline or whatever. But it's not fact. And that's how people are talking. They're talking like it's a fact that she's alive in other worlds. And it might happen. But it's a fact that she died in our world. Another example I can give is from the comments of the last videos. Multiple people thinking that... She's not dead because Red 13 can censor at the end of the game. Which might prove that she's at least not, a f in that moment at least, not a figment of like Cloud's imagination or whatever. But him censoring her doesn't mean that she's alive either. I mean, goddamn, Marlene senses her at the end of the original FF7, right? Doesn't mean shit. Plus, we've seen her multiple times throughout the fucking FF7 compilation, like, interacting with people from the live stream. So, like, Red 13 censoring her doesn't mean anything. Plus, their connection, right? Her, like, touching him, giving him the knowledge of, like, the Whisperers and all that other shit at, in Remake might be why he can censor, but also his people being connected to the planet, Cosmic Canyon, and so on and so forth. Man, it just doesn't prove that she's alive. It's weird. FF7 Rebirth producer Kadase says that there might be some who expect a cloud breaking the barrier of fate in Remake to also alter what befalls Aerith. However, he says the concept behind the Remake project is to generally adhere to the story of the original game. We really don't need to spend a lot of time on that, but this is something we've been hearing the devs say for quite a while now, that they're trying to generally adhere to the original FF7, try to keep the story in line with the OG FF7. It's all going to connect to Advent Children. And I was against that for the longest time because of the wacky shit that happens in Remake. And while there is some wacky shit that happens in Rebirth, I mean, ultimately, we do see, again, Aerith die at the end. And, and most of the events are relatively the same to OG FF7. There is still some questions. I don't think that, you know, we have all the answers currently. The main question I have after I play Rebirth is the multi-world shit. What's going on there exactly? But besides that, you know, it's really just FF7 so far, right? So I just... I'm going into the third game expecting OG FF7. I don't know if there's going to be brand new shit. I don't know if Zack is alive. I, I hope he's alive. I want there to be new shit. I've said this for years on the channel. I want there to be new stuff. I would love for this to be a sequel. Like, coming after Advent Children and Dare to Serve and shit. I would love for that to be the case. But I don't know if it is. And we move on. Tetsuya Nomura considers implementing an airship to be the single biggest obstacle posed by Part 3 of the FF7 Remake project. He's worried about needing wide, flat surfaces to land such a giant aircraft and fears this might limit how freely the vehicle can be used. Nomura says this is an issue developers have been struggling with for a while. It used to be you could land an airship icon on a cartoonish map, but with the graphical scale now more realistic, this no longer suffices. However, he's confident the staff will rise to the occasion. 
So something we've seen the devs talk about quite a bit, the kind of their worry about the high wind, and it's something I'm very curious about, because we have see the high wind in Rebirth, and it's quite massive. And the areas we have in Rebirth are decent-sized zones, but there's not a lot of areas that I think you could land the high wind currently in, in the world map that we have. Like, I think the Krill region, like, the desert part of it, it's definitely got a lot of flatlands that you could land the high wind. There's probably aspects of, like, the grasslands. There's probably areas in each of them. Gangaga would be a little interesting, because that's very much jungle, right? I don't know if you land the fucking high wind anywhere in Gangaga, except for, like, the airstrip itself, I guess. So they might do, like, um, maybe add airstrips more around the world, or maybe make maybe expand the zones we have a little bit, just so you can land the high wind in more areas, or have specific areas within each of the regions to land the high wind. I don't know. It'd be interesting to see. Kazushika Nojima says that in writing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth Scenario, he studied Buddhism's Yoga Chara, which I've never heard of, and Young's Theory of the Collective Unconscious. Referring to these should make it easier to understand how the game's world works, and may even hint at the story's ending. Look, I'm not going to pretend like I know a lot about this shit. I know a little bit about Carl Jung. Uh, I'd never heard of the Buddhism Yoga Chara or whatever the hell that is. Uh, but they've used Carl Jung in the past for previous Final Fantasy games. Uh, I've seen it with, like, Resident Arc when they broke down... I don't remember if it was Final Fantasy VIII, Final Fantasy X, or both of them, where they talked about Carl Jung and the Collective Unconscious and all kinds of other Carl Jung theories and things like that. Something they've used in the series before, though, so it's not really a surprise to see it implemented in the remake project. The Ultimania indicates that the world where Zack attempts to meet Hojo and find a cure for Cloud is a continuation of the Terrier world and not a separate new one that has split off. So I want to read that because it's a little bit important because it shows like the difference between like Shinra Arc's translations and Audrey's translations. The reason why I talk about Audrey's translations the way I do, because she was doing a similar thread of like the different worlds, the five, six different worlds, whatever. But she was talking about there being multiple terrier worlds, which doesn't even make sense conceptually because like it's been indicated in remake, in rebirth, that there's a different world, there's a different dog. So why would they have multiple worlds using the same dog? But here we have the Ultimania and shit confirming that it's just a continuation of the terrier world, obviously. Because from her perspective, and I've seen other people point out as well, is whenever Zack's in the Shinner building behind him is a sign with the terrier dog on it, but it's like a sad looking terrier dog. And for some reason, that meant, like, confirmation of there being different terrier worlds, which is just weird. Because, again, if there's a different world, different dog. Also, the sign says temporarily closed, which I think would be indicative of this world being destroyed, or, or him hopping timelines, whatever. Because after this, of course, we see Zack and Pug world with Biggs in the reactor. But also, we saw all the shit at the end of the game with Zack and fighting Sephiroth with Cloud and all that other shit. And we see Zack wake up in the church at the end of the game in a mysterious world, which could be a brand new one or one of the other timelines. FF7 Rebirth creative director Nomura was the one who wrote the English message that was displayed at the end of the closing cutscene. The meaning is something like the end of the journey isn't promised, or the conclusion is still totally undecided. I mean, that seemed pretty obvious to me, getting to the end of Rebirth, but it's really just the ending of Remake all over again, right? The unknown journey will continue. No promises await at journey's end. Like, it's the same thing, essentially. Is the ending truly undecided? No. Like, I think we're going to get to the conclusion of this story, and it's going to be relatively the same. I don't know that there won't be new shit in between. Like, is Zack alive type shit at the end of the game, right? I don't know. I don't know anymore. I don't know what's new, what's not going to be new. It's just, it's at this point, it just feels like a marketing gimmick. Like, ooh, is there going to be new stuff? Is there not going to be new stuff? Because to be honest, like going through Remake and then going through Rebirth, I feel like we didn't get a lot of answers as to what's totally going on, right? We got some new shit happening with Rebirth, of course, with the multi-world shit or whatever. But I feel like we're still kind of like, what is going on? Is, is people are alive? Are they not alive? Are people dead? I don't know. Like, it's just whatever. We're just having the same conversations we've been having for four fucking years. So this isn't really new information in terms of the Gi tribe, but we haven't talked about this yet on the channel, so I figured we could read this and then discuss it a bit. So further info, though, their home world was destroyed and they ended up in this world. The live stream rejected them since they're not from this world. I'm guessing kind of like how the live stream rejects Nova. Since Cetra didn't want to coexist with them, they created the black material to destroy this world. So I personally like these changes. That's something I've talked about on the channel that I wanted when it came to Rebirth. There's more lore for the Gi tribe because we didn't have a whole lot. Like, they were obviously warring with Cosmo Canyon or something. But we just didn't know anything about them. And then now we got that with Rebirth where they're apparently from a different world. Which is something I want to know more about. Like, how... Their home world was destroyed and they ended up here. But, like, what does that fucking mean? Like, how do they get here? How do they just end up on our world if their world was destroyed? Uh, and they're rejected by the live stream because they're not from the planet, which is kind of interesting. And, like, they're the ones that created the black material this time. As opposed to... I think with the original lore, like, the planet created the white material and the black material, right? Which I never liked. Because, like, why would the planet create a material that can destroy it? Why would you? Why would the planet intentionally create, like, the black material or whatever? I thought that was always weird. Maybe it's unintentional, but regardless, the planet created it. So I like the idea now that, like, the black materia is just, like, it's not from this world. It's created by other beings from a different world and shit, and they're mad at the Cetra. They created the black materia to destroy the world. I think it's pretty interesting. It's kind of similar to Genova, right? She comes from a different world. She comes from outer space or whatever, crashed on the planet. So, like, how did they get here? Did they come here through Genova? Is that a possibility, potentially? Did Genova destroy the world? Is that how they got here? Maybe. 
So this is pretty interesting too, a little bit of lore for Queen's Blood. Apparently in Queen's Blood, the devs wanted to weave a sort of urban legend into the card game lore by saying the battle between the Shadowblood Queen and the Emerald Witch is supposed to represent the struggle between Genova and the Cetra. So that's kind of interesting just to get a little bit of backstory or whatever for Queen's Blood, a little bit of lore for it. It kind of reminds me of, if you've played Yu-Gi-Oh, if you watch the anime and shit, like... The card game in the anime is based on, like, these ancient Egyptian battles that used to happen back in the day where there was, like, these giant stone tablets that they would summon the monsters out of to fight with and shit. And, you know, thousands and thousands of years down the road or whatever, that's when the Yu-Gi-Oh card game was made in the anime. And that's kind of what that's based on, right? And it's kind of a similar thing here, right? There's the old battle between Genova and the Cetras and years down the line. This card game is kind of reminiscent of that. Now we can move on to some more Part 3 related stuff. Battle Director Taruki Endo mentions he wants Part 3 to have even more freedom to explore the world. FF7 Rebirth gave you a certain degree of freedom to explore, but there were still points on the map that you were told to head to. He suggests that in Part 3, instead of having a linear way of getting from one point to another, it'd be cool to give players an option of how they want to get to the destination. Obviously, gotta agree with that. Like, I think with the third game, they should go full open world. Obviously, we're gonna have the airship, so it kind of has to be open world. We gotta be able to fly around the entire planet and kind of land for the most part wherever we want to. So you kind of gotta go that route. So definitely, would love to have the freedom to kind of get from one destination to the next, however we want to. Whether we want to take the airship to get there, or maybe the buggy, depending on the areas, a chocobo, depending on the areas, uh, the submarine, which we're gonna talk about here pretty quickly, or you know whatever. Like, we're not forced to like go a specific path, this linear direction. We gotta go like this way to get there. Like, we should be able to get there however we want to, right? Shouldn't have to have like four segments. Where we gotta like ride the cargo ship, for example. It kind of makes sense in Rebirth. It's still early in the world, early in the story. We gotta, we don't have our own access to vehicles and things like that. So we have to ride the cargo ship. But once we get the freedom to explore with like the airship, it would make sense to have a very linear world. And this is probably the juiciest bit of info, which is why we saved it for last. Some gameplay elements Nomura is wondering how to best create in part three, where to land the airship realistically, which we've already kind of talked about multiple times actually, how to portray giant weapons roaming the world, how to traverse the ocean floor. It's kind of short and to the point, but they do plan on having the weapons roaming around the planet, which is kind of exciting because they could have gone the route of just having them be at a specific point in the story. You got to go there and fight them. But it, this with the original game we had for one, obviously emerald weapon in the ocean kind of swimming around. You had ultimate weapon flying around. Inevitably, you gotta. It's part of the story, but you eventually do gotta chase it around the planet to like fight it and defeat it finally. And then also, as a part of the story, you have Diamond Weapon eventually coming out of the ocean to attack Midgar, right? But it seems like we're gonna have at least that, maybe more. I hope that we can fight Sapphire Weapon. I've said this on the channel probably a year or two ago or something, did a whole video about it. I wanna fight Sapphire Weapon. It's always intrigued me. I like that. I like the element of like Shinner being able to take down one of them with the sister ray cannon or whatever, like blowing its fucking head off and killing it. Like, it's pretty cool that it's not just our group, the heroes, that can take down all the bad guys. Like, Shinner has some power to them, too. I really like that. But I also want to fight Sapphire Weapon as well, for sure. It's kind of crazy to think, like, picturing like the world of Rebirth, because we have most of the world there for FF7. Like, picturing like the weapons like roaming around there is going to be very interesting. I don't know how they're going to do that quite exactly. Kind of like reminiscent of maybe like a world boss in other RPGs that kind of just roams the world. You fucking go, you try to fight it. If you're underleveled, you're going to get your ass kicked, something along those lines. I don't know. Some people said in the replies to Audrey's tweet, like, kind of how they handled Gilgamesh in the Corral Desert, like him kind of popping up and around and being all gigantic and shit. Like, they could do something like that. Definitely be big. I don't know canonically how big they're supposed to be. Now, we've seen Diamond Weapon in, like, Kingsglaive, I think, for Final Fantasy XV, and he's goddamn massive. And I want them to be that big. Like, it needs to be on par with, like, maybe Whisper Harbinger slash, like, Bizarre Sephiroth, Sephiroth Reborn at the end of Rebirth, something along those lines. they got to be big. I want them to be gigantic goddamn kaijus that we got to fight, for sure. But let's not neglect that last part. The Namor is kind of wondering how they're going to handle exploring the bottom of the ocean. So, confirmation of the submarine, but not just the submarine for exploration, which, I mean... We, it's kind of negated in terms of like what it did in the original game because you could go throughout the entire ocean but we got that with the tiny bronco now right now we're fixing tiny bronco at the end so i don't know if the tiny bronco is going to be doing that anymore we might still use the submarine for that in terms of like top of the water exploration but we get to explore the ocean in the third game which is absolutely fucking fantastic this is why i love the remake project because they're not straying away from anything for the most part from the original ff7 I hope with it for the third game is that it's to scale for the most part with the actual ocean that we can explore, like above the water. Because with the original game, you could explore the whole world, right, on top of the water. But when you dove down into the water, it was still the same, like, biome, the same area to explore, right? Which was still badass for the original, you know, for PS1, of course. But in the modern day, I don't want to be on one side of the planet, dive down, I'm in the same area I'd be if I was on the other side of the planet, right? Like, we need this to be unique areas. And hopefully there's, like, some hidden shit, right? Some deep... Some unique areas to like dive down into. Maybe you find a hidden cave, go up in there, find some treasure. We didn't really get the hidden treasure type shit with Rebirth. They could remedy that with the third game, hopefully. And just getting to explore the ocean. I can't imagine in Rebirth's graphics, I guess the, the third game's graphics, going around the bottom of the ocean and like going around a corner and there's fucking gigantic goddamn emerald weapon just swimming at me. Like that type of shit, 
I'm ready for it. I'm going to shit my pants when that happens. So potentially be like a roundabout confirmation of the sunken Gelnica and those crazy monsters there. Getting to see those with like modern day graphics would be kind of awesome. Like hopefully they make it into a creepy area that kind of let us down with the fucking Shinner Manor. You can explore that at all. That was fucking underwhelming. Like god damn it. Son of a bitch. Maybe they can make that up with the sunken Gelnica though. But my dudes, that'll be pretty much the video. We talked about kind of all the important ones that I want to talk about today. There's always more translations out there. There's a couple that we didn't touch on today. And by the time we do another video, either tomorrow or the next day, there'll probably be even more translations. Hopefully some more juicy bits. But like most exciting thing for me out of this whole video was this last bit, dude. The getting to explore the bottom of the ocean. That's something I just wasn't sure if they were going to do or not. I was always hopeful because they're trying to give us pretty much everything that the original FF7 offered. But that's like a huge undertaking, right? Getting to explore the, the world with a high, high wind, which is obviously going to be... That's a huge undertaking by itself, too, but also getting to explore the bottom of the ocean. And it seems like that's going to be a possibility, which I cannot fucking wait for. Anyways, that's the video. So, I'm sure you guys are in the description below. Follow me on Twitter, that's it, YT. That's it. Bye. I used to care what people thought, but now I care more. And nobody out here's got it figured out. So, therefore, I've lost all hope of a happy ending, depending on whether or not it's worth it. So insecure, no one's perfect. We spend it with no shame. We blow that. Like old train, we in here. Like low gain, or leave it. Like hope